Thank you very much all for coming, and I hope I'm loud enough for the back of the auditorium. Um, so um, I'm going to talk today uh, about how we measure obesity, uh, give you some facts about obesity in the US and in Australia, um, give you some history ab about uh, dietary guidelines and introduce you to the newly released dietary uh, guidelines released just now in the US and in Australia. Uh, talk about a, a research interest in my lab about the body acidity and metabolic disease and eventually give you some tips about healthy eating, only four, um, and hopefully you will find that uh, at the end of my talk you maybe know a bit better and maybe it's clearer. So we measure a uh, overweight and obesity by the body mass index. You might have, have heard of it. It's not perfect, but it correlates very well with metabolic disease. So for a woman of an average height of uh, 1 meter 65 or 5 foot 5, if she weighs 48 kilograms, then she's underweight. 7 kilograms more would move her to the normal, normal weight category. 10 kilograms more, she's already in the overweight uh, side of things. Uh, 10 kilograms more, and she's at the highest end of the overweight range. Another 10 kilograms, and she moved into the obesity class one. Another 10 kilograms, at 95 kilograms, she's classified as obesity class two and at 105 kilograms, she's already in the obesity class three, which is the morbid obesity. We calculate BMI on weight in kilogram divided by a height in meters squared. So it's very easy to do. Uh, each of you can do it uh, uh, himself uh, uh, and, and, and have a, a classif and, and classify yourself. So the US released some data and it's quite uh, uh, scary. 74% of men in the US are either overweight or obese. So only 26% of the population in the US are normal weight. And you've heard from uh, Jerry Greenfield about the association of obesity with metabolic disease. So this carries a lot of risk. The situation in women is not a, a, a far behind the men. However, if women are heavy, then they're more likely to be obese than overweight, which is also interesting. Now, what's happening in Australia? This is data starting in 1989, going all the way to 2012. So while you can see that the rate of overweight individuals has uh, stagnated from 89 to 2012, the rate of obesity had almost tripled and together overweight and obese uh, uh, people in Australia make up 63% of the population. So we're not in good shape at all. This is the map of Australia, and the more, the, the darker the color, the more obesity and overweight is prevalent. So you can see that there are states that are in green state. Uh, if you look at Sydney, then this is typical to big cities. Big cities have less overweight and obesity. However, if you go north, west, or south, the situation becomes darker. It's not moving. Ah, okay. Now, if it's pretty simple, if what we eat equals what we expand, we 
maintain our weight. And some of us are very good at it. And for years over years, we maintain the same weight. Now, it's not that simple just because when we age, we are less efficient or in terms of energy, we are more efficient, but we don't burn as much. Now, when what we eat is outweighs what we expend, we get weight gain. Now, governments for years and years have released dietary guidelines and the US is leading and Australia is after. And dietary guidelines released along the years were uh, appropriate for the period they were released in. So, for instance, in the 40s, it was all about uh, uh, preventing deficiencies, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. However, from the 70s onwards, we're dealing with a society where we have a, a available food and in excess. And I would like to take you through those dietary guidelines and show you what has changed because a lot has changed in 2015. So in the 80s, big cohort studies started emerging to, and saying that a high intake of fat in the diet is associated with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events. We now know that these studies were not able to differentiate between the sources of fat. And so in the 80s, we got this uh, first uh, guideline to limit this, the source of fat in our diet. So fat would not make more than we want you to eat. And this includes avocado and uh, olive oil and the fat that we find in fish, these are all good for you and in an inverse association to metabolic disease. So if you would like to have 50% of your diet from fat and the fat is coming from <coughs> avocado and nuts, go ahead, it's very good for you. Um, and with it came another a, a br bright light, which is the consumption of the low fat or no fat sweetened products. It's out. Don't have it. Dairy products are coming with fat for almost everyone in this room. If you have it as is, the yogurt as is and not the low fat yogurt with lots of sugar in it, it's better for you. No doubt it's better for you because we know that the sugar is very problematic for you, the high sugar in the diet. And in fact, the sweetened, the soft drinks, they're all out. They were there in the pyramid at the top, eat in moderation. No, they're not there anymore. Now, oh, it's going quicker than me. So now I want to uh, introduce a, a, an area of research uh, in my lab, and it has to do with uh, body acidity and insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the state that precedes type 2 diabetes. It's a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. It started some seven years ago where large cohort studies again of 3,000, 5,000 people had emerged to show that body acidity, the higher the body acidity, the more prevalent type 2 diabetes. Now body acidity can be measured and these studies measured markers of those uh, uh, of body acidity. Um, And the Western diet uh, increases body acidity. So the way it does it, we have very good mechanisms to keep our body acidity at neutrality. And this is a very strict range that all of us have. However, what is starting to be claimed 
being a bit on the lower side of this normal range is not good for your uh, is not good for metabolic disease and in particular type 2 diabetes We can, as I said, we can measure body acidity in, in research and we, we, we term this a uh, decrease in body acidity within the normal range, mild metabolic acidosis. It's not pathological. We think that with an, a, a long exposure for Western style diet, we are on that side of the mild metabolic acidosis. And there are studies now that show that this is associated with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes risk. So if you look at this table of foods and they're sorted based on the acidogenic potential, then you can recognize those two, Parmesan and salami, for instance, that have a high ac acidic uh, potential. And at the very bottom, you find the greens, the celery, the spinach, and the fruits, the raisins. They have a, the opposite, the alkaline potential to buffer the acidity. And we can calculate it based on food dietary questionnaires. We wanted to find out what happens to the body after we eat a meal, because we thought that um, if a meal does drive a decrease, if, if the whole diet drives a decrease uh, in a, a, an increase in body acidity, then we may detect it in one Western style breakfast. So we had a volunteer and he arrived fasting and we then gave him either a buffer, a, an approved medication a, that decreases body acidity or a placebo on two different occasions. We then gave him to his satisfaction a, an unhealthy meal and we measured what happens to blood pH and blood sugar after that meal and we did it twice once after giving him the buffer medication and once after giving him a placebo I will show you the results with the sugar with the blood in, with the uh, sugar levels in blood so, with the placebo, we found what we expected, an increase in, in blood glucose and a decrease back to norm, normal, oh, not back to normal levels uh, at uh, about an hour or an hour and a half. When we gave him the buffer drug, we found this. So the peak of glucose was lower and we even found a level which is a considered hypoglycemia of under four after giving him this drug. So we're now investigating this further. We have people coming and we are serving them this beautiful meal and we are looking at what happens to body acidity and to regulators of glucose homeostasis in the body. But if you Google the alkaline diet, you'll find two and a half million results within just 0.27 seconds. And this is all unsubstantiated data, a lot of testimonials uh, uh, um, claiming that buffering your body acidity by a proper diet 
can prevent disease. But what we're doing now is we testing it. So if I only have to give you four tips for eating healthily, it would be use your kitchen, start cooking. We have nice kitchens and we don't use them enough. Just bear in mind that the food that you will cook for yourself from the raw ingredients is 100% healthier than any food you're gonna get there because you will control what ingredients you buy and you will use olive oil rather than the cheapest oil in, in, uh, in the supermarket. Next, avoid processed foods. Now, a lady that once sat in the audience just like you, I owe this tip to her. She then became a Gavan donor and she supports my studies. And she told me, if you avoid the middle aisles in Woolies and Coles, that's it. <laughs> if you only go to the perimeter, you find the fresh food, that's it. The vegetables, the fruits, the meat, and the dairy products, that's all you need. So one very important tip, and drink water. Soft drink is out of the question. For me, I never get calories from a drink unless it's red wine, <laughs> okay? So forget about soft drink. It's non-existent and as well found in the middle aisles, so just avoid it. And add greens and uh, lots of vegetables to your diet because it's really good for you and it will make you more uh, satisfied for longer. And there are plenty of benefits I haven't mentioned. I only touched the acidity of the body. I haven't touched the composition of your gut bacteria that love the, the fruits and the vegetables. Without them, the composition is not good for is not good as well. It's affected by what we eat. So I'd like to thank you with a, a note that we're still looking for volunteers. I know we ask for a lot from you. You came here on a miserable day and we really thank you for that. We are still looking for volunteers. So in your packs, you'll find advertisements for those studies uh, ongoing in my lab. So please, Give us a call or send us an email and we'll contact you back. Thank you.